Thank you all for coming this afternoon. I'm Joe Palka, uh, and I'll be moderating this session. The session is called Beyond Moore's Law. Oh, a bit of housekeeping. Um, if you have a cell phone, please put it on silent. And we're using a hashtag for this uh, session, which means that if you put this into your Twitter tweet, it will pop up on a screen. And if it's reasonably coherent, it will be passed on to me. And I'll read it off the screen if I don't screw it up, which I have done. Um, so what we're going to talk about, so the topic is beyond Moore's Law. The two people who are speaking are Konstantin Novoselov, to my left. He's a research fellow in Mesoscopic Physics Research Group, University of Manchester in the United Kingdom, right? And to his left is Robert Sholkoff, Sterling Professor of Applied Physics and Physics at Yale University in America. Now, we titled this session Beyond Moore's Law. And first, I'm assuming that most of the people in this room know what Moore's Law is. But as Robert explained to me earlier, it's a law po po postulated by Gordon Moore 50 years ago that basically said, or that su suggested that the density of information that could be packed on a silicon chip was basically going to double for every 18 months up to a certain point. Now, the up to the certain point is a, is a question mark because at some point you run into the physical limits of the, the amount you can pack onto a chip and you start running into things that no longer follow the seemingly clear-cut laws of physics and they dive into these weirder laws of physics which Robert will talk a little bit about. So the thing is, we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about when Moore's Law is going to be reached. We're not going to talk about why it's coming soon or late. That's not what the topic is. We just know it's coming, and there's going to have to be something to come after that. And there are a multitude of approaches to what we're going to do to continue this incredible run we've been on of packing information into small and processing into smaller and smaller uh, devices. And there are a lot of approaches, but we're going to talk about two of them as represented by Kostya and Rob. And Kostya, as you probably all know, is an expert in graphene, which, for which he and Mr. Keim undergone, un, un, right, um, won the Nobel Prize in 2010. And Rob's Nobel Prize still hasn't been awarded, but we can expect that in any time. Um, uh, but he's been working on uh, quantum computing. So that's where we are. And I think I'll just start by saying to you, Kostya, what, what do you see? What part of the future uh, excites you? And what role might graphene play in it? Well, just to say first that uh, although I've been working, I started to work on graphene in 2004, probably. Currently, only 20% of my time is on graphene itself. And uh, since then, we expanded into many other two-dimensional crystals, many other materials which are only one atom thin. And depending on the particular application in, um, in electronics or in, um, com in computing, you would like to use one or another material for different applications. Or uh, what is even more exciting is the combination of many materials, because then you, you can create something which is called heterostructures, where you combine different properties of different materials and in, in a combination which, that, which won't be available to you from Mother Nature, and then you can achieve uh, completely novel Multi, multifunctional properties, multifunctional applications from uh, from those. So I can um, probably talk about on okay. Well, first, those. first maybe you could talk about why there was so much excitement around a, a sheet of atoms, a sheet that was one atom thick, essentially, right. a two D crystal. Well, uh, first of all, it most of the excitement came with graphene itself and. Uh, the first excitement and the, the major excitement for me is that is the two-dimensional material, one atom thick. And uh, if you would ask me 10 years ago, can you make one atom thick fabric, I would say probably not. Just all the, all the experience, previous experience tells you that it should decompose, it shouldn't be stable. That one was uh, particularly stable, extremely stable. And that's, if that is not not enough, we have very new, 
very unusual properties for electrons, for quasi-particles which, uh, which, which transfer uh, electrical current in, that, in, that, uh, in, in this material. They mimic um, quasi-relativistic Dirac, uh, Dirac fermions. I won't go into right. Thank you. into details, Thank you. but it's something very, very unusual for uh, electronics or for condensed matter physics. But then you have you have new you have lots of new opportunities, and of course, then it, it turns out that this material is extremely strong. It's impermeable to anything, extremely stretchable, and so on. So that was uh, for some time, uh, and, but then we figured it out that there are an a whole class of those materials, which are only one atom thick. And surprisingly, their properties are often very different from the properties of their three-dimensional precursors, from their three-dimensional counterparts. And exploring those properties is something very exciting for a physicist. You know, superconductivity in two, in two dimensions, very, very interesting ferromagnetism in, in, in two dimensions, and so on. And on top of that, the recent topic which we start to explore now is bringing all those crystals into heterostructures. And then we design a material on, on atomic level. We can encode different properties in, into this three-dimensional stack. And then um, we call it material on demand. You tell us which properties do you want, we can give it, we can give it to you from the stack. It's, um, it's okay. it's like uh, if you if you compare it to modern electronics to silicon, what we have now is a material which practically which is which is electronics now silicon, and then on top of that we build a structure. We cut it, we etch it, we put contacts, we evaporate gates. On top of that, we create structure which has the functionality. Uh, uh, what we are trying to do is to build materials with the functionality or already built on the materials level rather than on the structural level. So you have material which can which carry some information, some stru some functions in it or already. So it's a different paradigm, if you want. Is there a, a, a reasonably simple answer to the question? The simple answer is how do these new um, heterostructures that you're making solve the problem that is caused by the silicon right. three-dimensional structure. Now, it's, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. And you, uh, I'm, I'm probably the, the wrong person to answer this, because there is a roadmap. And mm -hmm. this, this Moore, Moore's law determines this roadmap, mm -hmm. where do we want to be. And if you want me to answer from physics perspective, then yes, we can. Uh, one of the one of the transitional points for modern electronics will be to switch from the planar arrangement of our transistors because currently what we're using we have the silicon wafer and we are using the planar arrangement just uh, those transistors situated next to, to each other we can switch to vertical arrangements and then it would bring clear benefits for example your the length of your transistor, the the effective length, we can make it into few atomic layers rather than 20 nanometer now as we've got as we've got at the moment. But what what you've got to realize that there is this roadmap, and before we're we're going to that transition, there will be many transitions b before that. We will probably start introducing new materials into silicon technology first, keeping the Siemens technology there, and then bringing gradually new architecture. That's where this vertical, this vertical uh, heterostructures would, uh, would come into play. And then later on, probably would have to switch to completely new paradigm, uh, new, uh, new architecture. And that's where um, Robert would would uh, would con con contribute because it's a completely different um, uh, different mindset of of computing. Okay, well, let's speak a little bit about that. The mindset uh, is completely different mm -hmm. in quantum computing. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how people who don't get that can <laughs> wrap their heads around it. Yeah, I can try. So, um, yeah, as you were saying. Uh, 
as they keep shrinking down uh, today's circuits, they're getting smaller and smaller, and they're approaching the atomic scale. And sort of conventional chip makers and electrical engineers look at that and say, oh, this is, this is a problem. The, the rules are changing, and the, the way we understand our circuits are, are breaking down. And uh, what we're trying to do in quantum computing is say, oh, uh, that's not a bug, that's a feature. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, let's accept that things uh, may change. And if we kind of go to a different paradigm, let's not have uh, a circuit which behaves in the ordinary way that electrical engineers and so on are trained, but is explicitly quantum in some sense. Uh, then we can process information and do computing tasks and so on in a, in a kind of new way. And quantum is giving you what? properties that traditional computers don't possess. Right. Well, so in a, in a traditional computer, uh, you represent the information as bits. And the, the bits are always supposed to be 0 or 1. They're never supposed to change on you. They're never supposed to be in an undefined state in between 0 and 1. Uh, the basic paradigm of quantum computing is to say, well, we'll replace that with a quantum bit. We call them qubits. And, uh, the quantum bit has, let's say, two energy levels, like an atom, uh, which we'll call 0 and 1. But then we can manipulate that in different ways. And we can make new states of that quantum bit. So we can put it in a superposition, which is both the 0 and the 1 at the same time. And that sounds maybe, at first glance, like a bad thing. Now we don't know what the information is that we've stored. But actually, a superposition is not just a random thing where you don't know if it's 0 or 1. It's really, in according to the rules of quantum mechanics, both representing the 0 and the 1 at the same time. And you know, eventually, then, the idea, mathematically, you can show is that uh, this allows the computer, in some sense, to explore many different possibilities, many permutations or uh, branches that the calculation you're doing could have taken, uh, but all at the same time. We were talking earlier, you use um, fairly traditional materials to create the Q bits that, or to create the, the entities that will hold the quantum information. Is, is it, can you see a connection between new materials? I mean, may, might that offer, solve some of the technological hurdles that you face, or are you still facing mathematical hurdles? Uh, no, no. I mean, uh, I'm an experimentalist, and so there are lots and lots of practical challenges in, in trying to realize a, a useful quantum computer. Uh, and absolutely, there are many materials challenges that we face and many things where new materials could really uh, be the enabling key, key thing. Um, but I guess we use, in our research at Yale, uh, fairly conventional materials. We use silicon or uh, sapphire uh, chips and uh, uh, metallic structures composed of aluminum. Um, but we're operating them under sort of exotic conditions, extreme conditions near absolute zero, where all the metals are superconducting. And then we can make uh, circuits where the things an electrical engineer usually works with, like current and voltage, are actually quantum objects that need to be described uh, with the rules that are usually applied to single atoms. Right. So, Kasia, do you have to also use exotic states to make your materials, or do they exist in more normal you know, uh, temperature and pressure? Well, we, we just, we, they exist in normal temperature and pressure, although we always like to keep them at, uh, at same extreme conditions, go to very low temperature, then it's, it's much easier to understand what is going on. But just to, to, to add to what Robert said, one of the um, reason uh, and one of the tasks to, if you try to work uh, with quantum computations, is to create, um, is to create, t for example, topologically protected states for so the quantum information can be transferred and manipulated, and that's one of the um, one one of the most exciting topic over the last maybe five years or so. We start finding those materials where we can create those topologically protected states and uh, heterostructures which I mentioned, they also allow allowed to, to create those states. So for um, part of my job is, of course, to think about possible applications, but what really excites me most is to find those new uh, quantum states of matter. So, who, I mean, 
so who is sufficiently interested in this question to give you money to try to solve it? Well, um, sorry. No, 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 it's fine. Um, you would be you would be surprised, but even electronic companies, I won't be able, probably, I won't be comfortable to talk about, to, no, to give you names, but very large uh, electronic corporations are interested in those, uh, in those uh, new architectures. So we're not talking, so we're, we're talking uh, medium time horizon uh, beyond five, seven years, but not 20 years, which might be 20, 15, 20 years, which might be the quantum computation. So the the, uh, the horizon about 10, 15 years. And um, one of the outcome of, of our research on the heterostructures was a new type of transistors, tunneling transistors, and apparently uh, several um, several big corporations working in uh, around electronics are interested in in those and we and we work closely with them. So this, I mean, they're looking to solve the. They're looking to the future of these sort of standard uh, electronic uh, devices, but to take them into the next generation to make them faster, less energy consumption, things like that. Well, I won't say that there is that currently there is panic and then that we don't know that they don't know how to how how to proceed, but they need to build start building the roadmap for, for the next 10 years and they know that they want to and, and of course as you uh, try to look further and further into the future you've got more and more possible opportunities so one of the opportunity they try to they, so this is one of the possible opportunities now right so rob you said that um uh one of the well there there is a similar curve uh, in terms of the uh, speed at which the problem facing quantum computing is being solved, <laughs> the Sholkov curve. <laughs> Maybe you can talk a little bit about what, where we are in terms of, you said we're moving from a period of a theoretical possibility into a period where quantum computing can actually begin to, you can begin to think of it as being possible to scale up and use in a, in a right. real device. Yeah, so, I mean, actually the sort of theoretical origins of uh, quantum computing and so on were in the uh, 1980s and 90s, and it was, uh, became a very popular topic in around 1994-95 with the discovery of this factorization algorithm by Peter Shor. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I think the field is evolving and uh, things are moving more quickly than, than we had thought at some point. So I guess uh, five years ago, you know, I was saying, and people like myself were saying, oh, I think it's 30 years away from, from uh, reality or from applications. And uh, today I'm saying it's maybe 10 years or 15 years away. And, uh, and so you know, I think uh, things are accelerating. So uh, now in terms of the, the Sholkoff's law, um, <clears throat> there are sort of two main branches of technology that people are investigating for quantum computing. One is to use microscopic systems like single atoms or single impurities in, in a semiconductor or things like that, which are very microscopic. Uh, and then there's another approach, which is what we specialize in, that's sort of making relatively large uh, uh, circuits and devices that uh, can still be coaxed into being uh, explicitly quantum mechanical and, and serve as quantum bits. And for the two approaches, they're sort of two different basic problems that were faced at the outset. So for a single atom or these microscopic devices, it was understood what their quantum mechanics was and that, of course, they could serve as a quantum bit. What was much less understood is how you would couple them together and connect them up into something you would imagine could process information and, and do a computation. Now, for our approach with the larger devices, we can make many, many of them, and we can array them in very complicated ways. The question there was, well, are they ever really going to be quantum enough? Will they uh, actually serve as quantum bits? And so uh, the place where we've seen the biggest progress is not, we haven't yet hit a Moore's law where the number of quantum bits in everyone's experiments around the world is doubling every 18 months. Mm -hmm. But for example, with our technology, uh, 
the lifetime over which our qubit will stay in the state we need it to be in without forgetting uh, has improved tenfold every two, three years. And so it's now reaching a point where we think that's enough to let us go forward. But are you in a place where you have some uh, uh, conceptual uh, hurdle that has to be cleared? Or are you at a place where you can tweak the parameters that you're currently working under and hope to get to the desired outcome? Yeah, so I think what uh, we find very exciting is right now with our devices, we really believe we can build things of a complexity that's never really been done in quantum mechanics or in, in quantum information processing. Uh, to go to the really large scale that would you know, help people solve computational problems, there are still issues that need to be uh, understood better and, and conquered. One of the biggest ones is something called quantum error correction, which is sort of a way of keeping the computer on track so that just one error doesn't take it uh, to a completely wrong answer. Uh, and that's something which, again, there's some mathematical understanding of, but the practicalities of how you achieve that and how hard it's going to be to uh, implement that uh, in necessary function before you can scale up, um, those are really the sort of science challenges we think we need to tackle in the next five years. Right. What is so, the go ahead. Uh, go ahead. current state of, uh, of, of art? Is there an alternative to JSON? in terms of scaling up? Sure. I mean, uh, as a flip answer, I sometimes now say that you know, at, there are as many p possible qubits or proposed qubits as there are quantum systems that people know about. Um, but uh, so, I mean, some of the leading things are quantum dots in semiconductors, uh, where you can confine one or two electrons uh, using some wires on a, on a chip. Uh, there are things like uh, NV centers, nitrogen uh, impurities in diamond. Uh, there are also these interesting ideas about using novel materials, like you were saying, to realize Majorana or fermions or uh, but other they, kinds of things. But those haven't been shown to be scalable yet. Uh, they've not been shown to be scalable. In some cases, we're still looking to really demonstrate the basic physics that this, this approach uh, would rely on. So I mean, they're very interesting uh, pieces of fundamental physics that people are discovering all along. And that's the thing that initially drew us to the problem. Uh, but you know, I think. Uh, uh, no one should say that they know everything they need to do in order to scale up yet, but I think the idea is that there are going to be a few approaches that will be able to move forward in the, in the near future. I just want to remind people that um, if you do happen to be watching and have a question that you'd like to have us ask, have me ask, um, send a twi tweet using that hashtag, Moore's Law, even though we're not talking about Moore's Law, you can still use it and we will capture it and it will be sent to me and I'll be able to ask the question. Kostya, when um, you said that 10 years ago, the, the, the things you're working on didn't probably weren't even considered possible. Well, the point is it's a, it's a relatively new field. Are you in a position now where you're simply just, there's everything, every day there's something new to learn about what the properties are of these crystals? Or have you moved into another uh, stage where you've begun to understand enough about them to predict, OK, this is what's going to happen if we do that, or do this manipulation with them? Well, um, first, uh, yeah, so uh, the, the systems with which, which, which we started to work uh, was 10 years ago. Graphene has quite a large number of the unique properties. Mm -hmm. the, the, the good thing is that lots of uh, physicists around the, the world found it interesting, so we tackled uh, this problem quite fast, I would say, and we've got very robust understanding on what is going on there. Um, however, still every now and then we can, uh, we're, we're coming across new properties and, and, new, uh, and new phenomena which are extremely exciting. Now, as I said, there is a whole class of those materials which are only one atom thick. And uh, from our experience with 3D objects, it's not, it's not always possible to predict what, what can you expect from those uh, one atom thick materials. You can try to think about it and, and you try to calculate, but uh, sometimes it's, it's easier to, 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 to measure, in fact. And also, there are a large number of those, of those materials as well to predict which one would be most exciting, 
Uh, well, it, it depends, first of all, on your, on your field. I, I mentioned superconductivity is very interesting in, in two dimensions, ferromagnetism. But, um, but also uh, you can, uh, but <coughs> also sometimes it's very hard to predict what are you going to find in those, in those crystals. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there one that you're particularly interested in? You said that they're depending on your application, but, but you're more interested in the materials themselves. So is there something well, that got you um, very excited right I'm, now? No, I'm, I'm not a material scientist myself, and uh, the uh, exciting part for me is to create structures where we can uh, put our hands on the quantum properties of electrons or quasi-particles there, and there are certain types of, of, of heterostructures which I would like to do and which I'm, which I'm very excited about. Some of them are maybe related to what Robert is studying, like um, decomposing a cuper pair into, uh, into two, two, two coherent electrons, and but there are quite a few of those of those structures. Okay, well, I said I'd be happy to take questions from the audience, and if anybody has one or wants to think of one, I can ask a question or two more, and then you can go. Or if somebody has a question right now, feel free. There is on, on your right. Yes. Thank you so much for that incredible information and the innovation that you're driving in the work that you're doing. My question is time to market. Um, given you know, sort of Moore's law of market, how are you seeing the time cycles shrinking from your research to getting into our ever shrinking hands? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and what is the interest in the work that you are doing and or who is helping both accelerate and amplify the work that you are doing? Um, let me probably start on this. Sure. sure. Uh, well, first of all, there are rules of physics with which we are very comfortable usually. So we, we, sometimes you can be disappointed that you cannot trace the TC of a superconductor much higher, but we are comfortable with it at least. And there are rules of economics with which we're really uh, struggling. And um, I can tell you the, um, uh, the time life of any discovery of, uh, I, of any new technique, either the new materials like graphene or many others, or uh, I, I can even try to predict what's going to, to happen with the quantum computations which uh, Robert is, is trying to, to do first. Uh, it would be very naive to expect that uh, those electronic corporations would jump and try to implement those uh, techniques into the front end uh, devices, into front end um, uh, microprocessors. What will happen is first you would see uh, individual transistors based on that uh, or another technology, then probably incorporate them as. Um, uh, as uh, devices for telecommunications where single <coughs> single transistors would work or a single modulator would work. As we do it, we learn more about the stability of those new materials or those new technologies. You develop the uh, new technologies and then you will be ready to, to incorporate it into the front, uh, into, into the front end uh, devices. Same will probably happen with the quantum information first before seeing, um, seeing uh, quantum computers, well, we have already a quantum computer and you, I will probably smart. challenge you to tell us more about that <laughs> one, but, <laughs> but uh, you would probably see more of quantum technology <coughs> in telecommunications and then as we, as we, as we use it there, we would uh, learn more about that and then at a certain moment we'll get ready to, 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 to put it into, uh, into a final device. So you won't see just an abrupt change and mm -hmm. an abrupt threshold. So it will be a gradual introduction of new materials, new technology into, into our life. Yeah, I, I, I think I would, uh, I would agree with uh, everything Kostya said. So um, it, there's, there's quantum computing and there's quantum information in general, right? So uh, a full-blown quantum computer uh, that outperforms 
any conventional computer is never, I think, going to end up in some future version of your phone. It's more likely to be a very specialized thing uh, that scientists use or that exists in the cloud somewhere and you access. Uh, but indeed, there are things such as uh, protocols for doing secure communication and so on, and there are some small versions of these available commercially already. Okay, so I, I think there will be some uh, uh, gradual transition as well. But, um, you know, I think uh, uh, people have been predicting the end of Moore's Law and that it's always 10 years away for the 50 years that it's been around. So it's maybe a dangerous thing to bet against it. Uh, uh, but, um, you know, nonetheless, I think uh, in that industry, right, you, you have a couple of things you have to do. You have to make sure that your next uh, fabrication plant two years from now is also producing things that are twice as good like everybody else. Uh, and there's a path that they follow for those time scale kind of innovations. But they also need to look at you know, what's coming ahead uh, a decade away or so. And so I think kind of at least for, for our field, we're maybe in a transition period where I think we're going to start to see more private sector funding and, and interest from, from industry and things. Yes. I'm interested from Constantina. Um, do you look at the effects of gravity on what you're doing? Are you interested in that? Are you interested in doing something in, in space and seeing what, you know, well, since there's such a business between the <coughs> quantum and the gravity? Um, it's, it would be quite a challenging experiment to do, but um, one of the possible experiment you can imagine you can uh, create a, a, an ex the thinnest possible mem membrane which is and you can use it uh, as um, uh, as the finest possible balance so you can measure masses using using the resonance on the, on this on, the, on this membrane uh, whether you would be able to <coughs> to to catch gravitation I think there are even even pub publications which which propose uh, square, square kilometers of graphene and trying to catch um, gravitational waves with that. So I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not really following that, 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 that literature. But um, something with, uh, which, which would link elastic properties and the possibility to measure really fine, fine masses uh, with, with, with graphene membranes would be ex extremely exciting. Um, I have a question from the Twitterverse. Um, it says, uh, it's question seven, if you want to put it up. It says, uh, graphene has a plenty of non-electronic related applications. Are those nearer term? That's very much true. And uh, yes, probably. Uh, or uh, electronic relation, uh, electronic related applications, which are not in the front end com computing, but in printed electronics. So uh, graphene is indeed extremely strong material and very uh, elastic and uh, pe people already start to use it as, um, um, as a uh, reinforcer for, uh, for plastics, for, for composite materials. It's, it's already been uh, be, being used and you can buy products by, uh, mm -hmm. where graphene is, is being used. Um, it has extremely good thermal conductivity properties, and that's another problem which we are facing. So probably one of the biggest issues is not even the miniaturization of, of our transistors, but really the heat dissipation. And uh, as a heat conductor or a, or a heat, heat spreader, the uh, paths which are based on, on graphene are being explored now, and, and there are quite a few of those. Printed electronics is extremely exciting and probably much more near term than, uh, than, than the front-end computing. Okay. Do you have a question? Yes. Microphone. Do you already have an idea uh, what your research uh, may mean to manufacturing technology? Because today's leading edge Silicon wafer fabs costs billion of dollars. Can you change this game? <laughs> right. We are, as I said, there are people are looking forward like ten years ahead, and there are research for 
new materials and for new architect architectures, and of course, uh, three five material like gallium arsenide and, and uh, indium gallium arsenide are, uh, are being ex uh, explored extremely uh, broadly. Graphene and many of the of other two dimensional uh, semi metals and semiconductors are being uh, are being studied. So. Uh, we work closely with industry. They are aware of the of the of the possibilities, and they are they are researching into it. Yes, there's a question there. Oh. No. Go ahead. We'll have we'll time. Um, I've read press accounts of, of quantum computers, apparently in commercial operation or semi-commercial operation, and. Um, but there seems to be a lot of controversy about benchmarking these, about whether they're actually computationally efficient. So I was curious why it's so complicated to find out whether something's being done better or not with these devices, or, or whether they even exist, or this is a fiction of the press. <laughs> well, okay, so there may be several ingredients in your question. Um, uh, I mean, the first thing is, even if when you looked at uh, uh, the early days of original computing, uh, as soon as people could build the hardware, it was not immediately uh, apparent what you should do with it, how you would, you know, the science of programming had to be developed uh, once people actually had uh, uh, the hardware. So uh, we don't know that much yet about uh, the applications of quantum computing and how you should program <coughs> it. And so one interesting thing that's coming out of this, uh, this topic and, uh, and these machines that are coming forward is sort of, you know, let's say someone, let's say I claim I've built a quantum computer and I hand it to you. What are the tests you do to it to see that I'm not pulling your leg, right? Um, uh, and so I think uh, a good part of this debate that's going on right now is we're doing the first steps in figuring out what it takes to validate the performance of some quantum-enabled device. So there, there are some uh, companies out there now, and uh, uh, one in particular uh, is, is promoting some hardware which uh, they sometimes described as a quantum computer, but is a little bit different than the quantum computer that uh, myself and, and my colleagues are working on. Uh, roughly, theirs is sort of an analog computer that is doing a quantum annealing kind of uh, thing, if you know what that means. But uh, it's basically a, yet another paradigm where quantum mechanics may help in solving certain kinds of problems. But there's less, I think, known about you know, what you really need to show in your hardware to convince someone that, that it's useful. Um, so, you know, I don't think we're there yet, but uh, th these are going to be questions that will come up more and more as time goes on. Thank you. You've got the microphone going that way. Thank you. I, um, I, I, I came here to learn something completely new. I'm totally out of my depth. I've probably understood about 5% of what you've said. Um, well, that's good. But um, that's no criticism of you. It's, it's a comment on my own ignorance. But um, I found it absolutely mind-blowing, really fascinating. Um, I want to be able to go home and explain to my nine-year-old grandson what he might be able to do when he's 25 as a result of what you're talking about that a 25-year-old couldn't do now. Is there any, any could, you, could you give me some insight into what that would look like? <coughs> okay, so I'll, I'll mm. probably stop if well. If you can well, think well, of something well. to start, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think what uh, becomes more and more evident now that we start to use more and more materials in our, uh, in our technology. Say, 20 years ago, silicon fabs would, would, would use maybe 10 of different elements. Now it's half of the periodic table is now. But we're going much, 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 much beyond that. New materials are being, are being utilized uh, as, uh, in, in, modern, in, in modern electronics. And even your mobile phones would have very uh, electronics which are based on very uh, different materials, not only on silicon. So this, this trend will probably continue and we will see that uh, <coughs> materials on demand or de designing new materials being more and more important and depending on the particular, uh, on the particular application, on the particular I don't know, frequency you want your transistor to, to operate, we will be able to uh, to, to compute and predict a, a new material and try to to produce it as well, so that's the that's one of one of the general trends that we'll we'll, we'll start start using more materials, much more much more new materials than 
we're using now. Yeah, I think uh, I might turn it around. So I'd say, you know, uh, we hope we can't actually predict what's going to happen in 25 years. And if you look back, right, I mean, computing and information technology 25 years ago, we, uh, you know, we still were just beginning to have a lot of the things that everyone takes for granted now, like email and e-commerce and uh, the internet and so on. So, uh, you know, whether it's quantum computing or new materials or whatever, I think uh, in 25 years, the way uh, modern technology is going the way information technology in particular is moving, uh, it should be very, very difficult to predict. But I, I would hope that, you know, uh, you know, if you had brought uh, your iPhone back to someone 25 years ago, he would have, you know, called you a wizard and, you know, said, how did you get this supercomputer? So, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, unless there's really uh, a shocking turn of events and everyone runs out of good ideas, which I really doubt, um, I think we'll have a similar uh, kind of feeling looking back from now, 25 years from hence. So. Yeah. First of all, I just want to uh, note that it's great to have a compatriot and a fellow Yaley on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my question is about this. So for me, all of this is very new. And uh, what, what else should I be looking at that the most exciting things happening <coughs> in physics, in computing in general? Uh, either now or, or in the future. So what are the other breakthrough ideas that perhaps should be on the horizon of all of us? <laughs> yeah, as just been mentioned, the, the most interesting things are those which you cannot predict. So it's, um, I can accurately predict the past, not, not, not the, uh, the future. <laughs> but, um, but generally, yes, the uh, quantum state of matter is 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 a big trend in in, uh, in physics, and that's I think it, it will continue. Uh, I can say something I learned just yesterday. So I mean, uh, uh, I was in a different session where uh, someone was talking about the capabilities of electronics and modern computing uh, being applied to trying to understand the brain. And so you know, I think one one hope also in this whole area is that maybe. Uh, quantum information or maybe uh, understanding better how the brain works will tell us just different ways that we can go about solving the problems that face us, so. Well, uh, th this, I mean, I'm still, I've, I've been listening to this discussion myself and trying to think, how do I sum this up? <laughs> <laughs> and how do, I, how do I lay out for you the future and the direction that this is taking us? And I, and I think it's actually quite, quite interesting. I think this idea that we really don't know but the fact that smart people are really paying a lot of attention to these two topics, I mean, two areas, suggests to me that there's something important there. And maybe they're wrong, and in, in 20 years we'll say, well, that was a dead end, but I don't think so. And so uh, I, I would encourage everybody just to pay attention and keep, keep an eye out and, and, and expect the unexpected, maybe that's the way to put it. But anyway, uh, thank you all for coming and thank the panel for their great presentation. Thank you.